Are you looking for answers that will bring resolution to a bewildered state? Or are you puzzled like the token you knock in the Bible who got entangled with scriptures? Then sit back as God's servant puts a key in your hand that will unlock revelations. God's Unification Mission presents Bridge Builders with Pastor J.D. Wukoko. It's your time to be connected. Stay tuned. Let's bow our heads to pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that of all the places that we could be today, we are at your feet. May you accept our worship. May your spirit speak through me and bless all those who hear because we have prayed in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Last Sunday, we talked again about marriages and we had a lot of fallouts. A lot of people wanting to hear more about it. However many the times there are that we talk about it, there is no time that anyone will be able to treat absolutely marriage. As I try to put things together, I complain to my friends how difficult it is to do. There are many things you think you know until you are tested by it. My prayer is that what we have heard will, rather than discourage, encourage each of us to do better in the name of Jesus. Just as an aside, when there is a problem in a marriage, there are only two things that you can do. You can run away from it or you can face it. When I had problems with my marriage overseas, I ran away from it. And it meant that I will always run away from difficulties. Those were the days of ignorance. When you run away from those problems, you will end up in pains. On the other hand, when you face the problem, there will be a period of pain, but you will end up in relief. So running away from your marital problems is a foolish thing to do. It should not be an alternative at all to the believer. You must do your best to make it better. You must be able to read your spouse when they are happy and when they are not. And remember to tell your wife or your husband that you love them. If you do not tell them so, someone will tell them outside. We have a problem in Africa. We are not good at expressing our feelings. Great as Nelson Mandela was, he had problems relating with his children because he was an African. And he grew up where men were made to look tough, never to be seen as weaklings. So whenever his emotions wanted to show, he shielded them. He wanted to look strong. But even the strongest men have to show love. So to show love is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. Because Jesus, the most powerful man to walk the earth, came because of love. And he died because of love. There is no marriage so bad that we should divorce it. Every marriage can change for the better. When people begin to change themselves, their marriages will be better. It is my prayer that the words that we have been hearing here will bring transformation to every home. That we will say thank you Lord in the end. In the name of Jesus. So we will continue with. Show me where you are buried. Part 5. And this is the last part. It is captioned. If your body is the temple of God. If your body is the temple of God. Then show me where you are buried. In your body. 
remember we started by saying that it is what you show Jesus that he can help you with when he met with the blind man he said what would you have me do for you the man said I wanted my sight restored where have you led him they took him to where they laid Lazarus you have to show Jesus where you want him to work for you but the truth is many times we like what we are doing and we don't want to show Jesus what that is love is what helps us to make that difference the love of God and the love of self may God bless his word in Jesus name for us to understand what this means it is important for us to see the temple that our bodies have become like we may have heard that said many times your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost your body if you don't know what a temple is it will just be a phrase the reason why many of us cannot focus on God's truth is because we want entertainment we we'll spend too much time in disco houses and we want to say that it must be like that in the house of God the work of God the service of God is not about emotions it is about submission it is about knowledge of the truth it is not about feelings because you have to do what you don't like to do because God wants you to do it it will help those parts of our bodies to die that run against him in the name of Jesus so we want to go back to the temple and try to as much as possible break it down recall when they were in the wilderness God said they should make a tabernacle that was the beginning the first temple was constructed by King Solomon in 950 BCE when they attacked Jerusalem the Babylonians completely destroyed it in 586 BCE one year after the fall of the Babylonian Empire the reconstruction of the temple began by the authorization of Cyrus the Great in 538 BCE it was completed after 23 years on the 3rd of Ada which is equivalent of March 12 515 BCE it was dedicated by Zerubbabel the Jewish governor in 332 BCE when the Jews refused the deification of Alexandria the Great of Macedonia the temple barely escaped another destruction you will see for a period of over a thousand years how the temple was fought against and then we're going to understand how it works with our bodies when Antiochus tried the Hellenization of the Jews by the introduction of the Greek pantheon into the temple another rebellion arose but it was soon cruelly crushed Antiochus had erected a statue of Zeus in their temple and Hellenic priests began to sacrifice pigs in the Hellenic religion that the Greek religion they sacrificed pigs to their gods Jews forbid pigs but when they overthrew Jerusalem they began to introduce the abomination of or the sacrilege of in 167 BCE the Jews rose up en masse behind Mathatheas and his five sons to fight and they won their freedom from Seleucid. Mathatheas son Judas Maccabeus now called the hammer rededicated the temple in 165 BCE and the Jews celebrate this event to this day as a major part of the festival of Hanukkah. The temple was rededicated under Judas Maccabeus in 164 BCE during the Roman era Pompey entered and thereby desecrated the Holy of Holies in 63 BCE but left the temple intact in 54 BCE Crassus looted the temple treasury only for him to die the year after at the battle of Carrhae against Parthia when news of this reached the Jews they revolted again only to be put down in 43 BCE around 20 BCE the buildings were renovated by Herod the Great and became known as Herod's temple during the Roman occupation of Judea the temple remained under the control of the Jewish people again it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE during the siege of Jerusalem during the last revolt of the Jews against the Romans in 132 to 135 CE Simon Bar Kokhba and Rabbi Akiva wanted to rebuild the temple but Bar Kokhba 
revolt, his revolt failed and the Jews were banned from Jerusalem except for Tijabav by the Roman Empire. The Emperor Julian failed to have the temple rebuilt in 363 CE. After the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem in the 7th century, Umayyad Caliph Abdul Al Malik Ibn Marwan ordered the construction of an Islamic shrine, the Dome of the Rock. On the very site of this temple, the Muslim they built a mosque there. Until this day, that mosque is standing there. The shrine has stood on the mount since 691 CE. The Al-Aqsa Mosque from roughly the same period also stands in the temple courtyard. The mount bears significance in Islam because they say that their forefathers were also the forefathers of the Jews. So we all have that place. Islamic tradition says that a temple was first built on the temple mount by Jacob and later renovated by Solomon, son of David. But we know in the Bible it was King Solomon who first built it. In addition, it is considered to be the site of the prophet Muhammad's night journey. That Muhammad went to heaven. And his ascent into one of the most significant events recounted in the Quran. In recent history, there is also a non letter against the temple. The temple man along with the entire old city of Jerusalem was captured. We talked about this some time ago. We talked about the end of days, the Sixth Day War. The old city of Jerusalem was captured from Jordan by Israel in 1967 during the Sixth Day War, allowing Jews once again to pray at the holy site. Before then, they were banned from going there. Jordan had occupied East Jerusalem and the Temple Mount immediately followed Israel's declaration of independence on 14 May 1948. Israel officially unified East Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount with the rest of Jerusalem in 1980 under the Jerusalem law through United Nations Security Council Resolution 478. Although they declared that the Jerusalem law to be in violation of international law, so they canceled it. The Muslim Waqaf based in Jordan has administrative control of the Temple Mount. In that six-day war, three paratroopers landed on that place after they captured it and prayerfully, honorably, as their forefathers did, went towards the mount and they climbed the top of the dome of the rock. And they put the flag of Israel there. It was a very, very emotional moment. Then their general, defense minister, Moshe Dayan, is one of the greatest war generals in history. Four hours later, he came and he said they should take that thing down. And he handed it over to the Muslims that they should have control of the site. Later, they asked him, why did you do that? He said, so that the temple will not be rebuilt. The temple may not be rebuilt because our bodies have become the temple of God. If there was so much battle over one single temple, and some people say you can see the road that Jesus Christ walked on when he was going to be crucified, where he was born, and you see all the wars, several wars, over several hundreds of years, if worry it was a battleground, those who saw war, this Biafran war will explain to you what that can mean. If a place is thoroughly ruined or rebuilt, oh, even forget worry. Look at Abuja. If someone died 100 years ago and you brought him back to Abuja and said, show me where your house used to be, do you think he'll be able to tell you? Of course he won't be able to tell you. That's 100 years ago. And somebody says, what happened 2,000 years ago after the Muslims who don't relate well with Christians, even if they knew it then, I can assure you they would destroy it. Somebody says, yes, where Jesus was buried, and that's where he walked on the street, where he was, and they walk and they make themselves. But God will give us insight. You see, knowledge is power. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because of knowledge, we shall be different and saved in the name of Jesus. The Talmud, that is a Jewish book, written by the holy interpreters of Jewish religion of Judaism. Yoma chapter 9b provides theological reasons for the destruction of the first temple. So why was the first temple destroyed? It was because the three cardinal sins were rampant in society. What are the three cardinal sins? One, idol worship. Two, licentiousness. And three, murder. Because of these three things happening in Israel, God turned his face from there and the temple 
was destroyed. So why then was the second temple destroyed? Because they should have learned from that first one. Because the society was involved in Torah. They were studying their Bibles. They were following the commandments. And they were following the acts of kindness. So why was it destroyed? It was because gratuitous hatred was rampant in the society. What is that? My brother or my sister said something about me. And you try to shave it off. Another time, the same person says something again, and you try to... You might say, well, I'm not bothered by him, but you are lying. Because something inside of you is building up. Your body refuses to accept that you hate the person, but in the spirit, you already hate that person. He's the last person that you want to see. Maybe you are in need. You went to someone for help. He failed to give you. And you see that person give to somebody else. And then you go again, and, you, and he fails to give you. You begin to see that person somewhere inside your heart as unfriendly that is gratuitous hatred could god destroy the second temple because of that there's a lesson it teaches that gratuitous hatred is equal in severity to the three cardinal sins idol worship license searches and murder are equal to when you hate your brother in your heart Christianity is not when you go and jump up and down in church or blow whistle and shout and pray and get prophecies that are false. Christianity is where you go to hear the word of God that is able to cleanse you and purify you. It is a place where people who are bad can struggle themselves to be better day by day. We have to see now why the first temple was destroyed. We talked about three things. The first one is idol worship. Exodus chapter 20 verse 4. Thou shalt not make to thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me. And keep my commandments. I overheard Brother Uputia sharing this morning when you hold the Bible in one hand and you hold another thing in the other hand, that doesn't make you a prophet if that thing that you hold is not from God. Some of us are so easily deluded, so easily deceived. The Bible says that some of us will be sent a strong delusion. In other words, God will supervise our race for error because we hate to hear the truth. To prophesy is simple. Go to any Native doctor, they will put something in your eyes and you'll be seeing people. So what? Will that give you eternal life? But when you do this, even up to the third and the fourth generation, you are putting your children at log ahead with God. Every father wants to make their children, every day I pray for my children, you will be greater than me. You will be wiser than me. You will be better spiritually and materially than me. It is the prayer of every father that their children grow older and wiser than they but if your legacy is to at night go and meet a native doctor and come in the daytime and or you go and meet a native doctor pastor they're all the same when you do good when you give a prophet a reward god says he will bless you with the prophet's reward if you give a false prophet a blessing you will get that false prophet's blessings many of us run from pillar to post because we have refused to identify that our bodies at the temple of the Holy Ghost. He said he will show mercy unto thousands of those who love him, who are able to separate themselves from the forces of the powers of darkness. The second one is licentiousness. And what is this? It is the quality of being lewd or lascivious. The quality of not being in accord with standards of right or good conduct. That's lasciviousness. And you can find this especially where People don't care about doctrines. Or when they do, they hold on to the wrong doctrines. Like once you are saved, you are always saved, no matter what you do. So you find lasciviousness. There are people doing how they like, but still thinking that they are the children of God. There is no time when once a person is saved, is always saved. If you believe that, you are a lascivious person. Another class of people who can get into this are those who look at their peers. Peer pressure. So let me do this because my friends are watching. 
you rebel against your parents because you have a friend who will hail you for being rude to your parents. Some people know what they are doing is wrong. They don't care about what they're doing. They just want to do it so somebody else can say you are a great guy. Peer pressure can bring that about. Rebellion or disobedience to parents. Talk about how our parents have stronghold over the children. If a father curses a child, that child is accursed. But God will help us. We will never curse our children. We will bless them instead in the name of Jesus. Pornography can also bring licentious. Some of us got hooked on that some time ago. When you are into pornography, your thoughts will constantly be on lewd things. They can bring you to that place of licentiousness. Number three is murder. Sometimes we think when you kill someone, that is only what murder is. We just heard about gratuitous hatred. That hatred that is so simple, so subtle, but God looks at the thought in your heart. Matthew chapter 5 verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said to them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. 22. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So to Jesus, murder is not only when you kill someone. You've heard that. Everybody knows that. But here is a newer commandment that I'm giving you. He says, If you love me, then keep my commandment. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. Love is what binds us. And how can you love when you hate? Even if you say, you fool, you run the risk of spending your time in hellfire. So when you are conscious of these things, you must be careful. That's why after baptism, we teach every person, don't curse, because the Spirit of God now resides in you. Bless instead. Now you can understand what Jesus said. Do good to those who despitefully use and persecute you. You can understand why. He said that. Always having evil thoughts towards other people. And those who do that are themselves not good. But they quit to find fault. That person did this one. That person that one. And you have that thing growing inside of you. God will deliver us from such in the name of Jesus. So why was the second temple destroyed? It shows gratuitous hatred is equal in severity to the three cardinal sins. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a tail bearer among thy people. Gossip didn't start today. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am your Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. You must be quick to talk to your brother when you see him going wrong. Don't encourage him to do wrong. But whatever you do, don't put hatred in your heart for your brother. 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you can love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself, you will be saved. Because I am the Lord. So now, let us look at the temple as the body. The ones that persistently took down the temple at various times through many generations did not happen by chance. They were inspired by the devil and orchestrated by him so that the temple will be destroyed. If he can destroy the true temple, he will have the false worship. Unfortunately, even in the church, it is very hard now for people to find the true worship. Why? Because the devil sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember his first vow? He will make sure that nobody serves God. Nowadays, not very many people will go to native doctors. Not very many civilized people will go to native doctors. Some will do out of difficulties, but not very many. But if, if native doctors came out as pastors, a lot of people will go there. So the devil is still being worked for, but in different 
um, avenues. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sensible. Watch. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Why is he going about looking for whom he will devour? Because he cannot devour everyone. There are some people that he cannot touch. May that person be you in the name of Jesus. Whom fairly resist in the faith, knowing the same sufferings are being completed in your brotherhood in the world. Why many of us fail or falter is because of difficulties that we run into. But the Bible says he teaches our hands to war. When God allows things to happen to you, it's because he's preparing you so that you can be a stronger, wiser, and better person. If you don't understand that, you begin to jump from pillar to post. And rather than solve problems, you complicate your life. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an hallowed is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh? Remember, we're looking at the temple, how it was revered, how they fought against, how they killed people because of it. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Your life is not yours. Your body is not yours. Because Jesus has bought it with, his pri with a price, with his own blood. For ye are bought with a price. Okay? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body and your spirit belong to God. So when you glorify him with these things, you are not doing anything special. You are only giving to him what belongs to him. Even after all those times, in the time of Jesus, the temple was still being treated with reverence. Acts chapter 21, verse 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia... When they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hold on him. 28. Crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further brought Greeks into the temple and had polluted this holy place. For they had seen before him, with him in the city, Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. They had seen Paul in the town with some Greeks. When they saw him with some people, they thought it were those Greeks that came with him. Because they thought that Paul brought non-Jews into the temple, they wanted to kill him. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they were about to kill him, Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. The temple, the temple. When they say your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit or the temple of God, you don't trifle with it. You don't open yourself up to anything and anyone. You are not doing yourself any good. If they were willing to stone Paul because they thought he brought a, a, a non-Jew in, how do you treat now that you understand what a temple is? So of what is your body a candidate? Because everyone will be rewarded according to their works. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Show me where you are buried if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit or the temple of God. And such were some of you, 
but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. If it is not a sin for me, if I drink, I'm not compelled to drink. Even though I can, I may. Because I will not be brought under the power of any. Where is it that you are struggling? Show the Lord. He will resurrect you in the name of Jesus. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Most of us, food, meat, drink, that. That's not what is important. Discipline. That is what is important. And God both raised up the Lord and he also raised up us by his power. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made the first wherein were the candlesticks and the table and the setting forth of loaves which is called the holy. We're looking again at the temple. And after the second veil the temple which is called the holy of holies. Let me try to describe this. The outer courts of the temple, proselytes were permitted to worship there. Only proselytes. Proselytes are non-Jews who became Judaizers. So in other words, non-natural Jews who were Judaizers. They were called proselytes. They did not have the right to enter the temple. They had an outer court where they remained to worship God. In the hall, you have only the Jews, natural Jews, could enter the temple hall to worship God. There was a place called the holy place. And there were candlesticks and the table and setting up and all that. And that is called the holy place. So that holy place was divided into two by a veil. The other half is called the holy of holies. And this one is the holy place. Into the second, the high priest alone, once a year, went in. Not without blood which he offered for his own and the people's ignorance. That's Hebrews 9 verse 7. God was showing something. The Holy of Holies, even though other priests could enter the holy place, beyond that curtain, only the high priests could go. When he wanted to enter, they would tie a rope around his waist so that if anything happened to him, if he died, they would pull him out with that rope. Nobody entered there whom had not been consecrated as the high priest. That's how much they revered their temple. But the Holy Ghost was signifying this, that the way into the holies was not yet made manifest while the former tabernacle was yet standing. There's now about a change in mode of worship. While that tabernacle was there, Jesus had not shed his blood. We were not Christians. This was purely Judaic. Now let us look at the turn of events. Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus again crying with a loud voice, yielded up the ghosts when he was dying. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top even to the bottom. That other side, which no priest could see or enter, suddenly, once Jesus died, it was the curtain that separated that holy place was opened. Saying that now nobody needs the high priest. Everyone has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now you don't need to run from pillar to post. Develop yourself because you are supposed to have access directly now to God. And the graves were opened when Jesus died. And many bodies of the saints that had slept arose. The power of the resurrected Christ. Once he died, graves of People who had been buried opened and they came out. There was resurrection with his death. And when they came out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. People saw them and knew that this was that man who died and was buried that day. Now he is back. Let us just think for a moment. If gold is sold to those who know the value, do you deserve being sold gold to if life is awarded to those who understand God's word and obey it, do you deserve eternal life? If now that you understand what the temple is, 
You don't go about bragging, my body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. How do you treat this temple? Is it with the reverence that the Jews treated the temple in Jerusalem or the way the Romans and the Greeks treated it? All of these will determine where we will spend eternity. In John chapter 4 verse 20, it is written, Our fathers adored or worshipped on this mountain, and you say that at Jerusalem is the place where men must worship. Jesus saith to her, Woman, believe me that the hour cometh when you shall neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall adore the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father also seeketh such to worship him. 24. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Not that they may worship him, they must worship him in spirit and truth. Many of us don't like the truth. Many of us rebel against the truth. Many of us don't know where to draw the line. Many of us don't fear God because we are modern people. I was watching an Islamic program and there were women taking their places, remaining where they were. And I called somebody's attention. I said, see that? In Christianity, we don't want that. And that started only about 200 years ago in America. Illuminati, we looked at that some time ago. No, we don't want to cover. Why, why cover your hair? Why not do this? You see, all the Muslim women, they had their hair covered. The original doctrine has they kept them. Because you messed with them, they killed you. So grace has its own problem. God is not looking for people that will be forced to serve him. If you give God money because somebody forced you to, you just threw your money away. God will accept your money only because it comes from your heart. He loves cheerful giving. He loves worship that comes from your heart. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship God in truth without the spirit. Because it is the spirit that brings you into contact with the truth. Praise the Lord. When we come to church, it is because we want to worship God in spirit and in truth. We want to know what the spirit reveals to us. How God wants us to serve him. If a native juju wants you to serve them in a particular way, if you did it the other way, you either run mad or you would die. So these people respect their God. Even Jesus Christ said it. He said the children of this world, they are wiser than the children of light. It is the word of God that you hear that will wash you, that will cleanse you, that will purify you. If you have itching ears, you want to hear what you want to hear, you will end up where those people are. Because in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 16, it is written, The leaders of these people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. So if you run after a leader that is not called, if the devil planted that person and you go with them, God will not only destroy that man, it will destroy you who ran with him. The leaders of these people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. That shall not be you in the name of Jesus. So if we must leave, we have to show Jesus where we are buried. For some people, it is drunkenness. For other people, it is adultery. For some fornicators, some lying, some whatever it is, the sin that easily besets you. Let us show the Lord so that he can resurrect us from that. In Mark chapter 9, verse 45, it is written, If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. 46. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. My father sent for me a few days ago. He said he listened to our program on Monday. He said he was proud of what I was doing, but this one that I went and talked about, Hellfire, he didn't like it. I said, why? What's wrong with Hellfire? He said, do I really think that God, that great, gracious, merciful father, can keep somebody in hellfire burning forever and ever. And I said to him, I was a bad son to you. When I was overseas, I did many wrong things to you. I said, did you kill me? He said, no, how could you kill me? Only really a wicked man can do that. I said, but God kills his children. When they disobey him, he kills them. Are you holier than God? 
It is not because God is wicked that he puts you there. It is his justice that demands that you go to hell. Because he has told you, when you do this, this is what you will get. When you do that, that is what you will get. And I read this passage to him. Where they are warm, diet not, and the fire is never quenched. And he sat back and looked at me and he smiled. He never said a word. But I know that he will chew on it. Because where he worships, they don't believe in hellfire. So he said to me, why would Jesus be putting people in hellfire? So I asked him, I said, so why was Jesus telling us about hellfire? Why was he spending so much time talking about hellfire? Let's not be deceived. It may be hard for us. We may have been on this spot too long. Everyone has a weakness. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God is able, if we can show him, to raise us up and make us whole again. Shall we just bow our heads? You know where the devil is plaguing you. You know where you are hurting. Help me, O oh God. I am a liar. Help me.